Good evening, everyone. I'm Naveen Vaswani, online producer with The Agenda. Thanks for joining another one of our webcasts. I think it's uh, fair to say that we can call them that now. Um, I am with Steve Pakin. Hi, Steve. How are you doing tonight? Excellent, Naveen. How are you doing tonight? I'm very well, thank you. Um, we do have a, a bunch of questions already in the queue, and just a reminder that this is a live video chat. There's a, there's a YouTube video next to our little chat console there, so if you're having any trouble at all with the video portion of the chat, just please refresh your page, and uh, if that doesn't work, close your browser, restart it, and try again. Uh, we appreciate your patience uh, in that matter. We haven't had uh, any technical issues of late, so hopefully that uh, string of luck will continue. And just a reminder before we do get going that we will be in uh, Kitchener-Waterloo this weekend, so if you're, if you're joining us from that region, uh, come on out to the Frickin' at the Tannery on Saturday. We're going to be there from 5 to 6.30. Steve will be there to answer your questions live instead of by video as we normally do. So we're looking forward to that. It's part of our Learning 2030 year-long series special, and you can see some of our web content in regards to that special. Uh, it's been up all week on the website, so hopefully you've been enjoying that. And just another reminder, if you are taking part in the in the text portion of our chat tonight, you will be seeing uh, Daniel Kitts, the producer with the program. He's going to be helping out. He's going to be uh, helping me uh, feed some questions. and. We do already have a, a number of questions in the queue, so I'm going to get this kicked off with one of the questions that we received on our blog post setting up this chat. Good stuff. Let's get to it. Great. It's from um, Bruce, Steve, and he asks, when Mr. McGinty's government introduced the 2004 health tax after promising not to, people called him a liar. Do you think the criticism shaped his later career as premier? And following those initial troubles, how would you rate his government in terms of honesty and transparency? Uh, ouch. Okay. Tough questions to start. Uh, my sense is Dalton McGinty has always been a pretty centered guy. Uh, he talks a lot about his family. He's one of ten kids. Uh, after his father, who held the seat that he now holds, held it before him, uh, his father held the seat after he died. Uh, apparently the kids all sat around, all of them, uh, at, the, um, at uh, their parents' home and said, well, one of us should get in here now and, and run for office. And Dalton said, Dalton, the man who is now Premier, said, well, there's a whole garage full of signs with my name on them, so I guess it should be me. Father's name was Dalton as well. Uh, the guy has, um, uh, has always been very public service oriented and minded, and as a result, if he has broken his promises, which he has done quite spectacularly several times over the years, uh, I think he does it from a place where he genuinely believes he's doing the right thing. He has this line where he says it's never too late to do the right thing, it's never too late to correct a mistake. So, you know, he, he quite spectacularly signed a Taxpayers Protection Act pledge uh, during that 2003 election campaign promising that he would not raise taxes and then as you quite correctly pointed out, Bruce, uh, almost as soon as the election was over they got a look at the books, they decided they needed more revenues and he went back on that pledge. I've watched Queen's Park for, you know, a little more than 25 years now, and um, it's hard for me to say that the McGinty government is any more egregious at lying, if you want to put it that way, or is any more egregious at breaking promises, which is another way to put it, than anybody else. Uh, I can remember on the first anniversary of Bob Ray's being in power in 1990, he won in 1990, 1991, on the first anniversary of his uh, government's uh, election, most uh, improbable election, uh, he, um, he broke the biggest promise he made uh, during the campaign leading to that 1990 election, which was to promise public auto insurance. Uh, we were in the middle of the worst recession since the Great Depression, and in his view, he just simply couldn't afford to keep that promise, and therefore he broke it. Now, is that a lie? Is that a broken prince, a broken promise? Uh, he would tell you, and Dalton McGinty, I suspect, would tell you as well, that when the circumstances change, his opinions change. So I, I get very concerned about throwing around this word lying. Um, I know it's very de rigueur in politics nowadays to use it, but I'm not a big fan of it. Great. Thank you, Steve. Uh, I'm going to get to one more question here um, from our website before we get to uh, some of the questions that are coming in on the chat. And it's from a user named Love Toronto who posted a couple of days ago. Love and they Toronto. write... Love Toronto, yeah. And they, and they write, the greatest generation paid the greatest taxes in Canadian history. Taxation approaches of the 1950s helped provide average Ontarians unparalleled increases in their quality of life. 
Is today's crisis of deficits, crumbling and inadequate infrastructure, etc., the result of politicians bankrupting the public purse and public assets in their national and international competition to have the lowest taxes? Well, I think to the best of my knowledge, your premise is correct, that in past generations they did pay higher tax rates as a percentage of people's income and as a percentage of the economy of, of the province or of the country, whatever. Uh, yes, we seem to be going through a period right now in our history, and it seemed to, you know, this ebbs and flows. Um, in the late 1980s in this province, uh, the Liberal government of the day, the David Peterson government, raised taxes many, many times and quite significantly. And his explanation was, people want us to do more, and therefore we need more revenue to do that. The economy was going great guns, raising taxes in the late 1980s as much as they did, did not slow down the economy. In fact, the economy at, at some points in Ontario was overheated. Revenues came in, Peterson government uh, doubled expenditures and actually balanced a few budgets along the way uh, because the revenues were so buoyant. Uh, but then it came to a point where uh, I guess the pendulum swings one way and then it swings another. And uh, Mike Harris obviously got elected in 1995, pledging to tax cuts, uh, pledging rather to cut taxes, and uh, did so rather significantly. He cut corporate tax rates. Uh, he cut personal income tax rates by 30%. The provincial portion of your income tax, he cut by 30%. Um, but then as 2003 came, uh, Dalton McGuinty decided that our public services needed rebuilding. He thought they were degraded during the Harris Eves years. And so he came in and, as you well know, raised taxes as Bruce just reminded us with that health tax in the first term and then by harmonizing the goods and services tax federally with the provincial sales tax and that raised taxes as well. So tax, this is a pendulum, tax increases or tax cuts going back and forth. And I guess many governments in their wisdom today have decided that the public has reached uh, a threshold where they just cannot or where much of the public, let's put it that way, just doesn't want to pay more tax. And so the rates may be historically low compared to the greatest generation, but in the judgment of the people whose job it is to make these decisions, they've decided we've hit the ceiling and therefore uh, it doesn't look like taxes are going to rise anytime soon. Thanks, Steve. Um, switching gears a bit, we do have a question from Liz that uh, Liz is on our live chat and she just sent this in. Uh, Ipsos Reid's annual survey of Canada's most trusted professions has consistently shown over the past 10 years that only 30% of Canadians trust journalists. As someone most people trust, what do you think are some of the journalistic behaviors that have caused so many Canadians to distrust journalists? Uh, first of all, Liz, if you tell me it's 30%, I'm surprised. I didn't think it was that high. Uh, I thought we were actually <clears throat> lower uh, around where lawyers, used car salesmen, and politicians are. Uh, but okay, I'll take your word for it that it's 30%. Uh, yes, we brought a lot of this on ourselves. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, we have um, we've behaved badly. Uh, we put superficial stuff on the air or in our newspapers. Uh, we have ridiculous food fights that don't seem the slightest bit authentic. We seem like we're solely interested in the unserious and in the titillating rather than in what is urgent and serious and important. Uh, we seem to reward bad behavior and don't reward good behavior. Uh, when politicians want to pop off in an overly dramatic, inauthentic way, we give them lots of attention. And when they actually try to do their jobs with some seriousness, we tend not to pay attention because we assume the viewers won't pay attention to somebody who is perhaps lower key, but doing their job better. So yeah, maybe that's got something to do with it. I hope, I won't pretend that we're never guilty of this, but I hope that the agenda and TVO in general are exceptions to that general rule. But I think it's pretty difficult to put on certainly American cable television most nights without thinking that you're in the middle of a freak show sometimes. Uh, so if we're as high as 30%, I'm surprised. I suspect we probably deserve to be lower. Thanks, Steve. Uh, we actually received a comment from uh, one, of our, one of our more um, interactive viewers and users of our website, who is Nehru, and uh, she sent this question in, and it's along the same line, so I'm going to go to that now. Given that the line between your professional and personal life is sometimes blurred and that you interact in a social context with politicians of all stripes, is it awkward or difficult to adopt a firm interviewer's stance and to push a tough line of questioning? Conversely, when you've had to ask the tough questions, is it ever awkward when you meet again in a social context? Well, the answer to the last part is no, because politicians, when they get, <clears throat> excuse me, I seem to have a frog in my throat tonight. Uh, politicians, when they're interviewed by journalists, I think they understand that it's part of the deal, that you're going to undergo 
what we call quote unquote the accountability interview, they expect hard questions. I don't think they expect rude questions. I don't think they expect insulting questions, but I think they expect uh, difficult, firm, uh, well placed questions. Uh, as to the first part, I I think we need to get a better understanding of what quote unquote socializing with politicians means. I don't at least to the best of my knowledge, I don't socialize with politicians. Uh, I don't have them over to my house for dinner. Um, if I get together with them, uh, for example, for a meal, it's strictly in a professional setting. Um, you know, it's a frequent thing at Queen's Park to, to have lunch with a politician to get more information on something because, frankly, that's the time of their day when they're able to do it. Uh, in the morning, they're in question period. In the afternoon, they're either committees or meeting constituents or doing other work. Uh, so they structure their days so that breakfast, lunch, dinner are, tend to be the times of days when you can get together with them. But, um, you know, I, I suppose I could be accused of having broken this rule somewhere along the way over the 30 years I've been in this game. Um, and if, you know, I, I, I imagine I've got my share of pleading guilty to, to, to do on that. Nothing comes to mind at the moment. But um, I, I think when when journalists and politicians get together, uh, there's an understanding that they have information and we want to get it. And the relationship is based on that, that half of it anyway. The other half is that they want exposure and attention for what they're doing and we can give it to them. There is an inevitability that if the politician is a good person and the journalist is a good person, they may develop a professional friendship. Um, I don't think there's anything outrageous about that. In fact, it may be helpful at the end of the day to actually learning more about the nature of what they do and how they make decisions. Uh, so I know once upon a time, um, once upon a time, Naveen, well, probably when I was your age, I wouldn't take a free cup of coffee from a politician because I was concerned that it would compromise me. Uh, I think I've learned after 30 years that taking a cup of coffee from a politician, um, you know, is, is not the end of the world and is not going to compromise you. And as long as you uh, do your job, um, you're okay. Fair enough, Steve. Thank you. Um... Just a heads up to our viewers who are in the chat watching the video, we are seeing your questions. Uh, we're just not publishing all of them into the into the text portion of the chat. We're just trying to keep it a, a little less confusing. So we do appreciate your patience. We're going to try to get to as many questions as we can. And here's one from uh, user MC. Hi, Steve. Big fan. From the perspective of an excellent moderator, how well do you feel the American debates have been moderated? And what impact, if any, do you see the debates having on the American election? Well, on the last point, the first debate certainly had a huge impact on the election. I mean, uh, Mitt Romney had been trailing badly through most of the campaign. He had an excellent debate, the first debate out. President Obama obviously didn't show up that night, and the result was that Romney's numbers went quite significantly north, and Obama's numbers went quite significantly south. And, you know, it's too early to tell whether or not that trend will continue to Election Day, uh, but the fact of the matter is the first debate moved polls in a way that I haven't seen since probably Jerry Ford in 1976 made a big mistake when he claimed that Eastern Europe was not under Russian domination. Uh, the election basically ended for him that night and um, it's yet to be seen whether or not Mr. Obama will pay the ultimate price uh, for his poor performance in the first debate. Obviously he's had two better debates since then and whether he's been able to stanch the bleeding uh, as a result of those two improved performances We'll wait and see. As for the moderation, boy, I can't remember a year. I can't remember a presidential year when the moderators were more often the story than this year. And I know that um, the guy who's been the executive producer of certainly all of the election debates that I've participated in and probably many before I got there, uh, his name's Mark Bulgutch. He's a producer for many, many years at CBC. Uh, before I did my first one, he said to me, you know how, Steve, when you go to a hockey game, and the next day, if you're reading in the newspaper something about how poorly officiated the game was and you see the referee's name in the paper, yeah, we don't want that here. And uh, I took that comment to heart, and it, it's sort of always been my hope, and so far I think it's come true, uh, that uh, the best debates are the ones where the candidates themselves shine and the process focuses on them, and the moderator uh, is not talked about in the newspapers the next day. And I'm pleased to say so far I think that's been the case. Uh, but this year, oh my goodness, starting with Jim Lehrer, who was excoriated in most media I saw. Um, Martha Raddatz also took considerable heat. Candy Crowley, as you know, took a lot of heat from, uh, I guess because she attempted to, in her view, correct the record that uh, seemed to need correcting at that moment. 
Uh, and Bob Schieffer even took some criticism, even though I think he did probably the best of the four of them. Um, I don't know why. I, I, I think we're lucky up here. We are a little kinder and gentler up here, and I have not faced a situation where the, any of the leadership candidates looked at me and, and started a fight with me, as they have with the moderators in the U.S. this year. Uh, quite frankly, I'm not sure how I'd handle it if they did. Um, I wouldn't expect it to happen. And I actually was on John Tory's radio show the other day on News Talk 1010, and he said that he was actually coached not to argue with me, that it would look bad. And I think it does look bad. I think when Mitt Romney gets, um, uh, I've got to be careful what word I use here, but let's just say when he starts complaining about what he perceives to be unfair treatment from the moderator, I think it reflects on, uh, poorly on him. And I've been watching the debates on CNN for the most part, and they have this people meter, a line in the middle of the screen, and every time he starts arguing for more time or that he's being unfairly treated, the line goes down. I think people don't like that either. I think it makes them look childish. So anyway, I've said too much, but there you go. I gotta learn to keep my answers shorter on these things. The questions, I gotta tell you Naveen, the questions usually end up being so good and so uh, thoughtful that they require, or I guess I feel they require longer answers and I don't want to shortchange anybody, but I do also have to remember that we want to get as many in as possible, so I'll try and keep them shorter. Cool, thank you Stephen. And just on your point, I think the emergence of Twitter as this social media tool, especially for, for media related events, like something like a debate, it's just ripe for people to, to just really get at the moderators and even those who are participating. And it's just, it seems, I agree with you, it does seem to be a lot different than it was four years ago when it comes to the American election. Yeah, and but even beyond the Twitterverse, which I would expect, you know, uh, but um, I mean, the New York Times, uh, Washington Post, all of the major newspapers across America and Canada were just, you know, really tough on the moderators. I did a blog post, you can look it up, it's somewhere on our website called Pity the Poor Moderators. It's a it's an awful assignment, frankly. It's quite brutal. It's an almost no win situation. You're, you know, if if any little thing goes wrong, you're going to have all sides yelling at you that you were unfair. Or um, anyway, can't complain because no one twisted no one twists their arms to do it. Fair enough. And uh, producer Daniel Kiss actually uh, <clears throat> fed that link into the chat, so it's right there for you to click on uh, the blog post about the moderators. Thank you, Daniel, for doing that. Thanks, Daniel. Uh, next question is uh, back to Ontario politics. It's from Victor. When Mike Harris left, Ernie Eves inherited the, the, the Conservatives' bad reputation and became the guy who lost power. Similar situation for Paul Martin and Jean Chrétien. Is this a thought that would be going through the minds of Ontario Liberal MPPs right now? Well, if it isn't, it should be. And, Victor, that's a really good point because the fact is no rookie leader uh, in the last 41 years of Ontario political history has won a majority government. Uh, it's been extremely difficult not only to win elections now, but then to perpetuate any potential dynasty that you've tried to create. Uh, you'll remember, of course, it was Bill Davis back in 1971 as a rookie candidate who won a majority, and no one's done it since then. Remember, David Peterson lost an election, Bob Ray lost an election, Mike Harris left on his own terms, but then rookie leader Ernie Eves lost the next election, uh, Dalton McGuinty lost his first election, uh, Bob Ray lost his first election, Mike Harris lost his first election, Technically, David Peterson lost his first election. He got four fewer seats than, than Frank Miller did. So the liberal leader who takes over for Dalton McGuinty is running into a bit of a historical pattern here, which is it's pretty darn tough to win your first election, and they all know it. Uh, there is a fatigue factor uh, after the liberals have been in power for nine years. Tim Hudak, of course, will have had, as will have Andrea Horvath, uh, they will each have had one election under their belt when the next election does come along. That's a huge advantage. Uh, running as a cabinet minister, or running certainly as just a, um, a single member in your own riding, uh, is just nothing like running a province-wide campaign. Uh, it's just so much harder and so much more brutal on you physically, emotionally, mentally, and it really does help to have one of these things under your belt before you go out there and try to find success. The next liberal leader, obviously, who will be chosen at a convention, I think the 25th, 26th of January, uh, the delegates will be looking for somebody who presumably is um, fresh-faced enough um, so, that, so that the liberal government can look like it is renewing itself in an appropriate fashion, but experienced enough uh, to be able to get out there for the first time on the hustings as a rookie leader and not be completely overwhelmed. That's hard to do. Great. Thank you, Steve. And uh, the next question comes from Keith, and it's in regards to the interview uh, we aired last night with uh, Premier Dalton McGuinty, and 
I will say that I, I was moderating a chat along with Daniel on Twitter, and we, we did see some some comments, questions about the interview. Some people weren't happy with it, and Keith asks, were certain questions off limits when you last interviewed McGinty yesterday? I would have asked McGinty how he can live with himself after blowing a billion billion dollar canceling blowing billions of dollars canceling power play plants in an effort to save his political neck. Uh, well, the short answer to the question is no. There are never any questions that are off limits with any person who ever comes on this program. Let me say that again. I have never in the tens of thousands of guests that I've interviewed here on five different programs for uh, 20 years at TVO made given any undertaking to any person that I would not ask a particular question at about a particular thing. Now there are th questions I wouldn't ask just as a matter of either politeness or uh, we had the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court of Canada on the program once and I obviously wouldn't ask her uh, any questions about a particular case that she was working on uh, because obviously she would say to me I'm I have to make a judgment on that case and I can't talk about it. Uh, we both know that and so therefore it would be a waste of time to ask that question. So no, no questions off limits between me and Premier McGinty. And look, these things, I, I, I uh, looked at the, the Twitterverse uh, last night and today as well to see what some of the feedback was and it ran the gamut from terrific interview, loved it, really fascinating, to uh, it was terrible, worst thing I've ever seen, uh, you pulled your punches and threw a bunch of softballs up there. Uh, and I obviously accept the verdict of uh, every single person who watches the interview. People watch it through the prism of their own experience, of their own political positions, of their own expectations of me and of this program, and that's fine. And I wouldn't attempt to convince anybody uh, that what they saw was inaccurate. Uh, people are going to see what they want to see. Um, I, I would say that one of the things that we try to do on this program is not do what everybody else does or if we do have to cover things that everybody else does then at least cover them in a different way so I thought given that this was the first interview that the premier had done since he announced his resignation and prorogued parliament uh, I wanted to get into some of the understanding of why he made those decisions uh, we hadn't really had a chance to flesh out all of the background behind the prorogation decision so last night we learned, for example, that he gave the lieutenant governor a heads up that he would be visiting him and asking for prorogation. We didn't know that before. So that when Dalton McGinty came to the lieutenant governor's office, he wasn't left cooling his heels there, as Stephen Harper was federally by the federal governor general. Uh, he got an answer right away. We also found out he didn't consult his caucus before making this decision, and he didn't consult his entire cabinet before making this decision, just select cabinet ministers. I also put into the record the fact that in all of the reporting I had done subsequent to that decision over the previous eight days, I couldn't find a single person, and that included liberals, uh, who felt good about this, who were really prepared to defend to the, to the hilt the Premier's decision. So all of that was put on the record, and that was the stuff I was particularly interested in. The gas plants, should I have spent more time on the gas plants? We did spend some time on it. Should I have spent more time on it? I don't know, maybe. Uh, you, you, you make these decisions. Uh, it seemed to me that the Premier had answered questions about the gas plants numerous times during question period and it seemed um, unlikely to me that we were going to break a lot of new ground on that so uh, you know all, all I can tell you is in, in summation and here I go I'm too long again Naveen but all I can tell you in summation is writing the questions for an interview deciding which questions to ask and then doing the interview involves literally a hundred decisions or more and you make them uh, on the spot often. You know, you have a second to decide what you're going to do. Do I follow up on that or do I go somewhere else? Uh, do I let them off the hook with that answer or are we running out of time and if I pursue it, I'm not going to get to something else? <clears throat> These are the decisions that constantly flow through my mind while I'm doing an interview. And uh, I don't claim for a second that I'm doing it the right way and that anybody else would do it the wrong way. There is no right way. Everybody has their own way of doing it and I'm sure Keith, that if you were in my chair, uh, you would have done it your way, and I'm, you know, might have turned out better, worse, perfectly fine. Who knows? Uh, but these are the decisions you make as you do these things, and you give it your best shot, and then you sit back and take the criticism, and that's okay. Fair, Steve. Thank you. Um, I think everyone can appreciate a detailed response on that type of question, especially when we're, we want feedback. So I think it's important for you to uh, to react to that. So thank you. Um, along the same lines, Catherine, uh, who's been really active on our website and on Twitter. 
Thank you, Catherine, for that. Um, she chimes in with a question on our blog. Naveen, I must reiterate that in my view, no one is much interested in McGuinty's future politically. In my opinion, the public is concerned about the future of all Ontarians, unlike McGuinty and the Liberal Party. Among our, our concerns, I have a question. What will it take for the government, all MPPs, to stand up for accountability and transparency in the public's interest and vote to allow the Ontario Ombudsman oversight of healthcare services? Great question. Uh, let me say on the first thing, I agree with you, which is why if you tuned into my interview last night in the 31 minutes that we had with the Premier, I don't think I asked one question about his political future. Uh, I think as I was signing off, I referred to the fact that the Premier had decided to take himself out of the running for the Liberal leadership nationally, uh, just to get that on the record, but I didn't waste any time asking him, you know, how'd you make the decision, why, you know, I, I agree with you. I think people are more f uh, focused on other issues and political accountability and transparency at the moment uh, is an absolutely white hot topic and I think you put your finger Catherine on a good one there. Uh, what's it going to take to get that kind of uh, access and give the Ombudsman oversight? Obviously it's going to take um, a politician who's prepared to do it. Uh, apparently none of the 24 premiers of Ontario who've had the job so far has been prepared to do it. Now in fairness to some of them, the Ombudsman didn't exist for for some of them, but certainly in modern Ontario history no one's seen fit to do it. Uh, maybe the next, um, you know, this might be an interesting opportunity Catherine for you to lobby the incoming uh, Liberal leadership candidates and ask them, maybe try and put their feet to the fire on this and ask them to promise it as a part of their uh, campaigns as they run for the leadership. Get the two opposition leaders to commit to doing it. Uh, get it in writing. Get them, get them on the record. And, uh, you know, the, the reality is, I, you know, when I first started covering politics 30 years ago, there, you know, there might have just been an ombudsman appointed, but it was a very new position if it was. And there certainly was no ombudsman at uh, Toronto City Hall. There were no integrity commissioners, accountability commissioners. None of this stuff existed. There were barely an election expenses commission. Um, I think it's fair to say that history's arrow is pointing towards more accountability and transparency. And as a result, uh, the more we put their feet to the fire on this stuff, I think the likelier it is that we're going to make progress on these issues. Great. Thank you, Steve. And thanks again, Catherine, for the great question. Um, a comment came in on the, on the text portion of the chat that was in regards to our conversation about the debates and um, even the newspapers being involved in some of the criticism. And Natchia wrote, uh, the New York Times and other media, they got involved because nowadays that's what the media does. They follow social media to see what people are talking about to write their stories. And um, Aiden has sent in a question based on that comment. And I think it's a really good one. Steve, do you think journalists are too reliant on Twitter and social media in general to source information or measure public opinion? Versus, you know, going offline, going outside, talking to people, picking up a phone, calling that person instead. Are we, is social media kind of creeping a little bit too much into uh, what journalists do right now? Well, I think social media is good for what it's good for. And that is getting people with relatively extreme or very committed points of view uh, to have an avenue for that point of view to be expressed. And that's why I, I, you know, I respect Twitter, and I, I like to take a look at it every day to see what the, uh, the viewpoints are that are coming in. But I don't for a second, um, I don't for a second believe that that's an all-encompassing point of view, or necessarily even representative of the population at large. It's representative of the, and Naveen, you can help me here. Do two percent of Ontarians tweet? I mean, would it be that high? That, that's a good question. I'm not, I'm not actually sure what it is, but I will oh. take a look. You know what? I'm guessing it's in that ballpark. So if 2% of the people tweet, that means 98% of them don't. And I don't think we can make any assumptions that the 2% adequately represents the 98%. These are people, the people who tend to tweet tend to be more committed, more involved, more engaged, and more extreme, I think it's fair to say, based on uh, certainly the uh, level of politesse I see in the Twitterverse. Uh, so no, you, you, uh, there was a reporter for the Washington Post many years ago named David Broder, and during election season, uh, David would do what a lot of reporters, he was the dean of the Washington Press Corps, and he would do what a lot of reporters just kind of stopped doing. Uh, you know, he didn't worry about the polls, and he didn't worry about uh, what the, you know, chattering classes were saying. He'd get in his car, and he'd go out, and he'd drive to Sioux City, Iowa, or, um, you, know, uh, you know, Toledo, Ohio, and he would just talk to people. And there's no substitute for just getting out there. I see Patrick Martin, our old friend, is doing that right now in the Globe and Mail, where he's on his motorcycle, and he's traveling across middle America, and just, uh, I think it's, 
every other day or so. If you want to, I'll give, a, give him a plug here because I think he's doing good work. Page, um, well, it's early in the Globe, page three or five of every day's Globe and Mail uh, has got a, another piece by Patrick. And he just is, he's out there finding stories, talking to Mr. and Mrs. Everyday USA to find out their views on things. And that's a good idea too because it's not just the viewpoints of people who know how to tweet or who are expert with Facebook and all of these other new relatively new social media that uh, we ought to be listening. We should be listening to everybody. That's that's a, another excellent response, Steve. Uh, and I was just reminded by my colleague David Irwin that this is the type of conversation, you know, that, that we're interested in having. And we're going to be up at Kitchener-Waterloo on Saturday evening from 5 to 6.30 at uh, the Firkin at the Tannery, um, which is next to the Communitech building. So come on out and let's chat in person. And uh, Steve, I just want to mention that... Um, Twitter user at CorbettBall. This is what he just uh, sent us on Twitter. Someone tell Steve he's not going on too long. Interesting to hear his views in detail. Okay, thank you for that. Um, I should also tell you, Naveen, you know, I I'm a big boy and I've got thick skin. So uh, I don't know what you're, you know, I don't see the, the questions as they come in. You do. I don't want you screen screening out, you know, nasty, tough questions, okay? Bring, bring, World Series Game 1 is on, and I'm very happy to take the fastballs right under the chin. You go ahead. Fair enough, Steve. You know, you know how I feel about it when you crowd the plate, so. <laughs> uh, here's the question from Angela. Hey, Steve, I know you are an avid reader. Just for curiosity, curiosity, excuse me, what is one of your favorite reads? One of my favorite reads? I wonder if Angela means fiction or nonfiction. You know what? I'm going to give her a nonfiction one because 99% 90, of what I read is nonfiction. So that, that'll give you some indication of um, how uncultured I am because I know I should read more fiction, but I have one of those jobs where I feel that I never know what I need to know, and therefore I always feel I need to know more about the subjects that I cover, and so I spend almost all my time reading nonfiction. I think one of the best nonfiction books I ever read, Angela, was called What It Takes. And it was a book that followed the 19, what year was it, 1988 presidential candidates for both the Republicans and the Democrats. And it was about a 12, 1300 page book. And it went into considerable detail about all of it. You know what, I'm taking it back. Was it 88 or it might have been, jeez. You know what, Naveen, I'm over 50 now and I have these memory lapses. Now I can't remember if it was 88 or 92, which election. Which one was it? Anyway, I, now it must have been 88 because I think Dukakis was in it, Al Gore and Joe Biden, Bob Dole. Yeah, I think it was 88. Okay. It was just a really in-depth portrayal of all of these, at the time, all men who were on the campaign trail and what they essentially put themselves through in order to get the respective nominations of their parties. And I just thought it was... Um, absolutely riveting, absolutely fascinating, and it was certainly, I've had the misfortune of writing three books about politics myself, and that was a very um, um, inspiring and um, uh, instructive book for me to help me gather my thoughts and, and figure out what I wanted to write in my books as well. Great, thanks Steve. Uh, I'm going to jump back to our website for a second for another question, and it is from uh, Najia, who was also taking part in our chat. Uh, she left the, this question about an hour ago, and it's it's about it's again going back to the process of the interviews and the questions that we ask on the program, and I think it's a good one in terms of the conversation we're having. So Nadia asks, do you pre do you prep your interviewees before the segment, as in give them an idea of the questions you'll be asking, especially if you're going to be asking them about something controversial, and moreover, do communications people of politicians or high level bureauc bureaucrats ask that you submit questions in advance even before consenting to the interview? No, 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 no. Quick on the a quick no on the second one. Uh, I'll tell you a funny story about this actually, because you may hear more about her in the future. Sandra Pupatello, when she was a cabinet minister in the Ontario government, she came in for an interview one day. I think she was economic development minister at the time. This is several years ago, and as she was sitting in the makeup chair, uh, I walked in, say hello. I always like to greet the guests ahead of time, chat with them for a couple of minutes, and um, she said to me, "So what are you going to ask me?" And I have absolutely no difficulty. Enable uh, in order that our guests can focus their thoughts better, giving them a you know a range of subjects upon which we might touch. And I say you know because I don't want them thinking about 25 different things when I really want them thinking hard about three. Uh, this is not the the program that you should watch if you want to find. Uh, we have this expression in journalism if you want to cover the waterfront, you know if if so I tell them 
you don't need to be. And I do this with uh, when Dwight Duncan has come in for budget day too or something. I, I said, put, put, put these other thoughts out of your mind. I'm not going to ask you about this, that, and that. Here are the three things I want to talk about, and we're going to go into depth on these three things. So I have no, tr no trouble sharing subject matter uh, with uh, the guests. Sandra Pupatello asked me for a list of question, for a, um, uh, a list of subject matter, and I gave her a general sense about what the interview was going to be about because I want her more carefully focused on what the subject would be. And she saw me holding a piece of paper in my hand, and she said, "Oh, are those the questions?" And she grabbed them out of my hand, and I grabbed them right back just as quickly. I said, "You can't see those. That's not how this works. You know that." And I, we had a little yuck about it, but uh, the fact is, no, nobody gets to see the questions ahead of time. Communications people are professional enough not to ask me for them, uh, and, I, and as I say, I have no difficulty telling them the areas within which I want to discuss. I want to discuss. Now, the first one, the first question Nadja asked was about preparing. Do I prep the guests? Is that it? I don't prep the guests in so much as, um, you know, tell them what I'm going to ask them, but I, and I appreciate that this may put me at a, you know, at variance with what other people do in journalism, and that's fine. I don't think there's a necessarily a right or a wrong answer on this. But for me, um, I want my guests focused and thinking deeply about the areas that I want to ask them about. And I'd prefer if they didn't go into interviews, scattered and prepared to think about 25 different potential areas of investigation if I only want to talk about a few. So I think that's better for them, I think it's better for me, and ultimately, therefore, better for the viewer. Great, thanks, Steve. Um, we talked about reading, what you were reading, so uh, we got a question from Doug in London who asks, or he has a comment first. Uh, Steve, we looked at TVO, the agenda for smart, insightful discussions. My question is, who do you listen to? What shows or podcasts do you listen to? And do you think podcasts hmm. have broadened your show's reach? Oh, on that last point, I know they have. I mean, we have two and a half million podcast downloads every year. So I think the fact that, I mean, when I started in this business, obviously, you you did a, you know, you taped a program or you did it live and it was out there once and then it was gone and that was it. You put all that effort into one play, and it was gone. Uh, the most wonderful development is the fact that now things live online, things live in your MP3 player, you can access them whenever you want. The podcasting thing has just been a, it's a godsend for us. Uh, the notion that we can do, and you've got to remember, I think, most programs we do on the agenda are not like your daily newspaper, which uh, I hope they don't object to my putting it this way. A lot of what is in your daily newspaper uh, is out of date the next day. It's not, uh, you know, particular. It is extremely timely for the day you will read it. It may not be at all timely a day later. That's not the kind of program we do. So that if people download uh, on their MP3 players or into their computers, oftentimes with our program you can watch it a week or two weeks or a month or two months later, and it's still fresh. It's still the subject is not so um, tied to that day's headlines that it's not uh, it, that it doesn't make sense. Uh, okay, I've got my MP3 player right here, and I listen to podcasts absolutely every day of my life. I tell you a little. Well, no, I was going to tell you a little secret about how I actually go to bed with this thing with the earphones on, but I probably shouldn't fess up to that. Okay, here we go, Naveen. You ready in alphabetical order here? Hit me with it. I'm a Red Sox fan, so I subscribe to the Boston Red Sox podcast. Fareed Zakaria, GPS. Alec Baldwin's here. The thing. Here's the thing. Live Drive with John Tory, uh, MSN. What's that? Morning Joe on MSNBC. Meet the Press, Prime Time Sports, Bob McCowan Show on the Fan, Real Time Bill Maher, Sunday Edition, Michael Enright, 60 Minutes. Those are the ones that I subscribe to all the time. And then, of course, as oh, Fox News Sunday. Sorry, I, and um, what's that other one? Uh, Stephanopoulos' program this week with George Stephanopoulos. So those are the ones that I subscribe to and listen to all the time and then of course as as I find out about one-offs along the way I'll listen to those as well uh, I don't I hope this is legal but I, I listen to podcasts when I'm driving certainly when I'm walking anywhere um, as I say as I go to sleep I find it's I never know what I need to know and so I'm constantly trying to keep up with as much as I possibly can great Steve thank you um, we have another question from uh... David from the live chat. 
Steve, I'm wondering if you would be interested in examining the issues of developers defying the Places to Grow Act, jumping the green belt and settling in Simcoe. For example, 10,000 homes on prime agricultural land north of Barrie. So it's more of a show idea there. Yeah, no, it's Dave, that's a great topic, and we've actually visited this topic a number of times in the past um, from a number of different angles. And yeah, let me listen, I'm uh, happy to, t as they say, take that under advisement. We have an editorial meeting here every Thursday, uh, every Thursday morning at 10 o'clock, all the uh, producers and I and our executive producer, Dan Dunsky, sit down and we all pitch story ideas, and I'm, I'm happy to take that one to this Thursday's editorial meeting. Great, thanks, Steve. Uh, I'm just feeding one in. Uh, I, I've lost it for a second. Just give me a moment. Oh, there it is from Liz. Uh, this is her second question of the night, and she asks, again, back to our process, and uh, I really like these types of questions, Steve. So what are some of your tips for someone appearing on the agenda for the first time? And I, I bring that up because it's like we know as producers that we're always looking for new faces, especially on a nightly show. So, uh, I think Naveen, has Liz been on the program? Liz? No, I don't think so. Oh, so she's just asking. She's not asking for herself. She's asking just uh, for general. Okay. That's right. Uh, number one tip, I would say this to anybody, whether they are appearing on the program for the first time or the 25th time. Be yourself. Be authentic. Be sincere. Don't lie. Um, give us the straight goods. Be yourself. Uh, the one thing the camera does better than anything is it can smell BS a mile away. And... Uh, I know this because I can feel it in my bones and I get the feedback from our viewers. Nobody's fooling anybody. Uh, if they are performing or acting or, uh, you know, faking outrage or indignation, anybody can see that. Uh, I remember having a, a guest who'd been on the program for the first time and after the interview was over, uh, she said to me, geez, I don't think I did that well. You know, I'm not glib and I'm not uh, particularly well-spoken and I think I stuttered a few times in there, and I said, no, you're absolutely wrong. I said, you may not be as polished as some people who've come on the program, but the one thing you had going for you that a lot of people, sadly, don't have, you were authentic, you were genuine, you were sincere, and people, people will see that. That'll come right through the camera into their bedrooms, living rooms, MP3 players, computers, whatever. And so that, that's tip number 1, 2, 7, 12, and 15. Fair enough, Steve. Thank you. Uh, we do have a tip from uh, from Doug in London. Steve Verlander is getting murdered by the Giants. It's five nothing. <laughs> and, well, uh, Doug, Doug, let me just say, I don't care. My team's not in it, but that's good to know. Thank you, Doug, for the update. We appreciate it. And uh, I'm going to get to a question now from Stephen Lee, one of our uh, a loyal chat um, participants. Thank you, Stephen, for the question. Steve, what is your view of the prorogation? Many columnists, journalists, and pundits have expressed great anger or discomfort over it as an affront to democracy. Do you agree with that view? Uh, Stephen, one of the things that I'm not allowed to do is opine on the major issues of the day. If I have to cover these issues, I'm not supposed to have an opinion about them. Of course, I do have an opinion on some things, uh, but um, I like to keep my job, and if I opine on things I'm not supposed to opine on, I will lose my job, and rightly so. So, I'm not going to tell you what I think. But what I will observe is, and I said this to the Premier last night when we did our interview, I told him I have talked to conservatives, New Democrats, liberals, academics, members of the public, um, members of uh, the uh, Fourth Estate, and I have, I said this last night before I heard Dwight Duncan's comments today, but I have yet to hear anybody who's offering a full-throated endorsement of what the Premier has done, uh, Cabinet Minister Kathleen Wynne, who may very well be a candidate for the leadership of the Liberal Party of Ontario, said the whole thing makes a lot of her, uh, uh, makes her and a lot of her colleagues uncomfortable. Um, and I'll just leave it there. Thanks, Steve. Uh, we have a question from Lucas, I, who is a new viewer of TVO and is curious. As to, where, as to where you think TVO fits in between our national broadcaster and the many private ones. Steve, what do you want TVO to mean to Ontarians? Uh, okay, I like this question because um, it lets me talk about a place that I love very much. Uh, before I started working here, which is uh, 20 plus years ago, I watched this channel, quite a bit actually, I discovered. I watched a lot of its documentaries, I watched its current affairs offerings, and of course my kids watched their kids programming. And when I got the call to come down here for uh, a job interview, I was 
anchoring the 6 o'clock news at the time on CBC, Toronto, I was intrigued because I liked the channel. I liked what they did. I liked where they stood on the broadcasting landscape. And by that I mean it was distinctive. It was then, and I really think and hope it is today. It didn't show commercials. It didn't interrupt interviews to show commercials. It seemed to treat people not as consumers that needed to be delivered to advertisers, but rather as citizens who needed to be engaged in the big issues of the day. And because of that, I was intrigued by the offer that they made, and obviously you know I took it, and here we are 20 years later to the month, I'm still here. I like the work we do here. I like what this place represents. I like the mission of this place. I'll tell you a story here. This is, um, I probably shouldn't tell this story, but because it happened in a private setting, but I, I hope the person who said it won't mind. Uh, I did a program here for 12 years called Studio 2. And I really enjoyed doing that program. It was a terrific program. I had the, the great joy of co-hosting with uh, two real pros, Mary Hines and Paula Todd. And, uh, and Alan Gregg, of course, contributed his um, insightful interviews as well to that program. And uh, like most programs, it, was, uh, it had a beginning, a middle, and an end. It came to an end after 12 years, which is a hell of a good run, i got to tell you, in the current affairs game. 12 years. I mean, it's longer than the journal lasted on CBC. And... We had an all-staff meeting at the um, Cineplex Odeon, whatever it's called, the Silver City across the road at Young and Eglinton. <clears throat> and I think it's fair to say not everybody in that room of our employees was happy about the fact that Studio 2 was being canceled to be replaced by a yet-to-be-described, yet-to-be-named current affairs offering, which turned out to be the agenda. And somebody, and good for them, was brave enough to stand up and ask our CEO, Lisa DeWild, who was at the front taking questions, said, how big an audience will this next unnamed, unknowable show have to get uh, in order for it to stay on the air? And the answer she gave just made me absolutely proud. Because it's an answer that nobody in private broadcasting would give, and it's an answer that nobody in, at CBC would give, and they're allegedly in public broadcasting as well. And the answer was, we're not going to judge the success or failure of this program by the size of the audience it gets, we're going to judge the success or failure of this program on whether it fulfills its mission. And that's just, i got to tell you, that's a different culture. That's a different language. Broadcasting executives, 99% of them don't speak that language. That's a different language. And that's a language that only somebody who was running a place like TVO could use. I never forgot her answer to that question, and I hope... <clears throat> we're in our seventh season now. Uh, we're still on the air, so I hope that um, I hope that we have fulfilled the mission that uh, that we all set out for ourselves uh, here doing the agenda. Great question, Lucas. Thank you for that, and hope you're enjoying uh, yourself as a new viewer of TVO. We really appreciate you taking part in this chat. That's great to see. Um, and I hope Lisa doesn't mind that I just spilled the beans on that because that was a closed door session. But you know what? I I I love that answer, and I'll never forget that answer. Thanks for sharing that, Steve. Um, as much as it hurts me to know that, Steve, you are a Red Sox fan, it is a fact, one that we cannot hide from. And we do have a question about your beloved Red Sox from Aiden. Can I show you something, Naveen? You see what that is right there? I, I've seen it. I've seen it. I, I can appreciate that. That, that. That's a picture of David Ortiz whooping it up because the Red Sox just won the 2004 World Series first time in 86 years. And John Farrell was there when they won. And Aiden has a question. How do you feel about John Farrell heading back to Boston? As a Red Sox fan, I'm pleased about it. Uh, when the, he was the Red Sox pitching coach before he took the Blue Jay job, uh, the Red Sox were uh, the Red Sox had a very good pitching staff at that time. Now, pitching coaches don't usually make good managers. There are very few examples of good pitching coaches becoming good managers. Uh, so, if Farrell does have success with the Red Sox, he's going to buck a trend. Uh, but um, they pitched well when he was the pitching coach, and they're pitching. Oh, I got to be. I, I gotta be careful I don't swear here, Naveen, right? But their pitching stank last year, the Red Sox pitching. Uh, and so if anybody can write this Red Sox ship, I'm hoping it's him. And I'm hoping it's not him, Steve. <laughs> no, that's that. okay. Uh, just just want to let everyone know that uh, we're gonna go till just about or before 10 p.m. Uh, 
We've been at it for almost an hour now, and uh, our queue is full for the questions. I've got a few more that uh, have come in and that I'm going to take, so my apologies if we weren't able to get to your question. Again, we really appreciate it. And Steve, the next question is from Corb, and he from asks... Whom, sorry, Naveen? Corb. 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 How do you spell that? C-O-R-B. C-O-R-B, okay. What is Steve's take on the future of professional journalism? And I, I preface the question with... Uh, the fact that I saw that you were at a, an event recently on the future of the newspaper, and um, I really enjoyed those tweets. Uh, we put them together on the website. I'll share the link in the chat. So have at it. The future of professional journalism. Sure. Uh, I support an organization called the Canadian Journalism uh, Foundation, which does some really good work. And uh, one of the things it does is that it does put symposiums together once a month. In fact, I'm moderating one for, uh, next month uh, down at First Canadian Place. And they had uh, four really sharp newspaper publishers in the other night, I guess last week, uh, to talk about the future of newspapering. And it, what, what I found most interesting about it is that as I watch newspapers closing all over North America, as I watch newspapers fighting like hell for circulation against uh, the Huffington Posts of the world and the Daily Beasts and these other online offerings, uh, these uh, three men and one woman publisher were all very excited, afraid, but excited about what um, the potential is for journalism today. I thought what was interesting is none of them particularly know, none of them knows what the future looks like in journalism. And so, Corb, it's difficult to answer this question because they're all, they're taking darts and they're throwing them at a wall right now. They're just trying stuff and they're hoping that it works. Uh, Michael Cook, who's the editor of the Toronto Star, the largest circulation newspaper in the country, was quite blunt when he said, we've had a website for 15 years and it hasn't made a dime yet. Uh, but they're still doing it, and they're still experimenting, and they're working at ways to uh, try to make it better and to get an audience. Uh, you know, of course, and John Stackhouse, the editor of The Globe, was there to just talk about um, their new paywall, which they've put up just this past Monday, and what a uh, fascinating campaign The Globe has run uh, with their un, you know, Globe Unlimited, and they had all those pictures on the front page of the paper on Monday uh, describing what their, how, how they were going to react um, to this brave new world. Corb, I don't think anybody has any of the answers yet. Everybody's experimenting, but it's a, it's a fabulous, fascinating time to be in journalism. All I know is that whatever I learned in J school, probably, well, how long ago was that now? 30 years ago, uh, <laughs> is probably so out of date by now, it's not even funny. We got, we got to keep rolling with the times, and the times are fascinating. Thank you, Steve. Uh, I was just trying to pull up a tweet from uh, Jay Rosen, actually. He was... Uh, he was tweeting about this topic as well, and I, I just found it. Uh, he says, he tweeted earlier tonight about an hour ago, you don't have to go to J school to go into journalism, period. That is the way it should be. A free, unregulated press demands it. Yeah, I, I, I completely agree with him. Uh, or Jay Rosen, I assume it's a guy. I don't know, maybe it's a woman. but uh, I, it, is, it is a guy. It is a guy, okay. Uh, I completely agree with that. And in fact, if you look at our gathering of producers here, uh, they are not all out of the journalism school experience. In fact, the executive producer of our program, I don't think ever went to journalism school. Um, I think it's a, you know, the best newsrooms or collections of producers or reporters, whatever, I, I think um, in the country are probably the ones that have the greatest mix in them. I don't think you'd want uh, uh, an entire staff made up of all people who were all trained all the same way with all the same experiences. You'd want people to bring a variety of experiences to the party, and through that mix of experiences, so presumably comes a better product. I believe that anyway. Great. Uh, we do have just a couple more questions, Steve. One is from uh, MC. How do you keep neutral? How do you keep neutral when faced with guests that you totally disagree with? Have you ever <laughs> slipped up in the heat of the moment? I don't think I have, but I'm prepared to be told that I have by others. But I don't think I have. And MC, I don't have any difficulty keeping my mouth shut because my job depends on it and I like my job a lot and I don't want to lose it. The other thing is, and I'll tell you a story, um, I'll, I'll, sorry Naveen, I'll try and make it short here. I did a book once on a guy named John Robarts and Dalton McGinty referred to this uh, last night on our program as well. And Robarts said when he was Premier, 1961 to 71, he said, any issue that's easy will be resolved well before it gets to my desk. By the time it gets to my desk, there are so many good arguments in favor of going one way as there are in favor of going another way that you can basically flip a coin. And McGinty mentioned this last night, the Premier did, when he said, you know, making decisions is the hardest thing you do in that job because, frankly, on most issues that get to his desk, 
he said, you know, 60% of the argument might call for this, but 40% goes against it. And even if you go for the 60%, circumstances could change and you could end up screwing it up anyway. So I tell you that story by, by uh, that long-winded story in, in order to tell you that even if I think I'm right about something and the guest is wrong, I have to allow for the possibility that I'm not right. And I've been covering journalism for 30 years, and I've been wrong so often I don't want to tell you. Uh, so it, it, it's no difficulty at all keeping my views to myself because I know in the back of my head this may be what I think, but hell, I could be wrong and have been a lot. Thanks, Steve. Um, our final question of the night, it's a personal one for you, and it's uh, from our user, uh, one of our users' guests on the, on the blog. Uh, thanks for joining us. Steve, what was your parents' influences on your, what was your parents' influence on your job, your education, on the, on the current take on what you do? How did they influence you? Uh, I would say the influence was the most uh, profound of uh, anything in my life. And by that, I mean they made the initial decision what school to send me to, uh, what summer camps I went to, uh, were extremely helpful in choosing universities to go to. Uh, um, it's funny, I, I've, um, I've asked my wife this question once, well, you know, are, are you more like your mom or your dad? And she has a very good line about this. She says, actually, I combine the worst pathologies of both my parents, which is very funny. And um, I'm going to go for the other, other side. I hope that I combine the best attributes of both of my folks. Um, and they are both very public-spirited minded people. They've both been deeply involved in their community, which is Hamilton, our community, Hamilton, uh, for many, many years. Um, and I would just simply say that uh, with their excellent guidance and uh, their sort of showing me the way uh, about, um, you know, what's important in terms of giving back and keeping the public good uh, at the forefront of what you do, uh, you know, I hope I've made my own little modest contribution to uh, making Ontario a little bit more interesting place in which to live. Uh, but yeah, the, the influence has been huge and continues to be huge. Thank you, Steve. Um, this was one of our, this was our first uh, late night agenda webcast, if you will. So I just want to thank you again for taking the time. Uh, we're getting a lot of good feedback about uh, the, the way we're engaging online, using social media, using the tools available to us. And um, my, right now, it seems like uh, we're, we're doing, we're trying. And I think that's important. So thank you. Not at all. This was an, another great experience, Naveen. And um, for those who haven't been with us before, we've tried doing these over the lunch hour, we've tried in the mid-afternoon, uh, and now we've tried one uh, after I get off the air at 9 o'clock at night. So, uh, you know, we'll keep experimenting and hopefully find um, a, a number of different options that will keep our viewers engaged. And uh, I must say I love the questions and uh, obviously having the opportunity to <clears throat> open up the curtains a little bit and show you how we do what we do here is um, we're happy to do that. Uh, lest I be blunt about this, you pay our salaries. We are in business for you. And we want to be as accountable to you. And if you have questions about how we do what we do or why we do what we do or make the decisions that we do, uh, we want to be very uh, as open as we can be in answering those questions. So next time we do this, Naveen, I want harder questions. Duly noted, Steve. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to end the, the, the video portion of our broadcast tonight and uh, then just wrap up the chat. Just a reminder, if you're in the Kitchener-Waterloo region, we're going to be in your town on Saturday and Sunday, so we hope to see you there. Um, our, our own little agenda event on Saturday evening from 5 to 6.30 at the Firkin and the Tannery. At the Firkin at the Tannery. So please drop by and say hello. Thank you, Steve. Thanks, everybody. We'll see you next time. Good night.